the Blue. Hello, welcome back to Into the Blue. Hope everyone's all right. Apologies for having a couple of weeks off. I went to the London Film Festival, decided to have a week off, then one turned into two, but normal service has now resumed. So this week I'm going to be doing my top five most anxiety-inducing movies of the decade. A couple of honourable mentions would be Good Time by the Safdie Brothers and Oxygen, starring Melanie Laurent. Another one that would have been right up there would have been Krisha, but I've used that in a couple of previous videos, so I'm going to leave that one out completely. So let's take a look at the five. At number five, Shiver Baby. So this film follows a young woman called Danielle, played by Rachel Sennett. Her parents are Debbie and Joel, and they've asked her to turn up to a shiver, which is a post-funeral gathering in the Jewish community. But it's for a relation that she can barely remember. So, like a lot of us probably would have done at that age, we turn up, but begrudgingly so she is present but she's grouchy as soon as she walks through the door she's got people tugging at her waist to see how much weight she's lost tussling her hair patting her cheeks it's full of the types of people that have known her forever and make it their business to know her business they know everything from who she turned up to the prom with to how often she does or doesn't go to the synagogue what they don't know is that she's turned her hand to sex work she has got a sugar daddy called Max and to a surprise and horror he's just turned up to the shiver along with his baby and his wife Kim. So he spots her so now he's looking very worried but it gets worse. Danielle's ex-best friend who also happens to be her ex-girlfriend called Maya has also turned up and she's watching too. And she is so in tune with Danielle she gets straight away the vibes that some things up so on the outside Danny's trying to keep it together but inside she is freaking the hell out everyone has friends of the family or members of the family that no matter what your age you feel like a child around them and she keeps getting trapped in conversations with these type of people or her parents who like most parents are masters of humiliation so we're constantly wondering whether she's going to put her foot in it or Max will or she'll be found out by his wife or her ex that will not give up picking away as she senses blood you can imagine in this situation you just have a complete panic attack she's constantly put into these super claustrophobic encounters in what was a quiet corner of the room with this really awkward situation or a really embarrassing confrontation then the score jumps and screeches like it's from a horror film as we go from one cringy moment to the next. Then by the time she's forced to interact with her sugar daddy's baby whose screams and cries are just ringing out throughout the house like an air raid siren, the heckles on your back will really be going up. You will want to look away but not just from the cringe factor. It's full of fast paced editing, really zippy dialogue and it's full of contentious topics such as patriarchy and feminism and gender norms. It is really really hard to believe that this is a feature debut as every aspect of the film comes together to make a pure masterclass in anxiety itself. At number four Climax. So this film's directed by Gaspar Noé and it's set in the mid 90s and it follows this troupe of 21 dancers from France. The film starts with these video interviews because at this point they're all just prospective candidates and they're answering questions from the troupe's creative director. This works really well with it having such a large cast. This helps set up all of their individual storylines before the action starts. Then the beat drops and the dancing begins. Noé's previous films always feature these amazing visual moments and this is no different. This film starts with a wide shot showing the 21 dancers doing their thing to this choreographed number and it's at least 10 minutes long. It's phenomenal with this sweeping camera work done by Noé himself that's completely mesmerising. And once the number ends, the after party starts. They're all staying at this former boarding school in the middle of nowhere. They're armed with lots of sangria and their own music to party to. And then we learn who's who, who hates who, who likes who, who to watch out for. And every dancer kind of has their own moment. Noé has described this half of the film as heaven and we get these amazing one shot long dance sequences but there's no heaven without hell and that's where we head next. 
The sangria has been spiked, probably with LSD, and then it all kicks off. Everyone reacts in different ways, some euphorically, some horrifyingly, and some deadly. And watching the fate of each character battling their sort of haze really keeps you glued. So we carry on with the long takes, but by now the camera is flipping, it's in and around all possible angles to capture the horror and the paranoia that set in. So as you can imagine, this half of the film is very disturbing. The visuals, the sound design and the actions and reactions of the dancers is all mega intense. And from here, as if you thought it not possible, the sequences, the camera work become even more frantic to match what's happening. It's also worth mentioning how stunning the lighting is because it really adds along with this pumping soundtrack to give this overall feeling that you're watching an actual nightmare. For me, this was a completely mind-blowing experience. It left me emotionally exhausted. My eyes and my senses were completely overwhelmed and I can't wait to do it all over again. At number three, The Killing of a Sacred Deer. So this film's directed by Yorgos Lanthimos, and with this being such a primal story, it is one of the most powerful and disturbing films that I've seen in quite some time. We follow Stephen, played by an amazing Colin Farrell. He's a top cardiologist who at first glance seems to have this idyllic life. He's married to his wife Anna, played by Nicole Kidman. She too is a top, top surgeon. They've got uh, two kids. They've got their daughter Kim and their son Bob. But then, strangely and weirdly, there's somebody else on the scene. Stephen has got this very, very strange relationship with an older teen called Martin, played by the outstanding Barry Keogh. They meet at a diner or by the river, and everything just seems off. Stephen gives him a very expensive watch, and then when he has to unexpectedly introduce him to a work colleague, he lies about how they know each other. So we just know that something bizarre is going on between these two. Martin appears increasingly psychologically disturbed. His actions and his speech, it's really odd and he's completely obsessed with Stephen. The film kind of insinuates that there's some kind of inappropriate relationship between them both. This may or may not be a red herring, but it definitely sets the tone for the super disturbing events that we get to follow. Things take a really dark turn when Martin shows up at Stephen's workplace and more or less forces him to come back to his home where he very blatantly encourages him to indulge in sexual relations with his mum, played by an unrecognisable Alicia Silverstone. We then learn that Martin's dad passed away from complications from heart surgery performed by Stephen. So it's clear Stephen feels some sort of guilt and it's why he entertains Martin's increasingly bizarre requests. Once Stephen lets Martin know that he has no intention of leaving his wife and kids to start a new life with him and his mum, then things go from dark to pitch black. Martin calmly tells Stephen that one of his family members must die and if he doesn't choose which one then it will happen sporadically and out of his control. First they'll lose their ability to walk and then they'll bleed from their eyes before dying. It all seems completely preposterous until one morning the son Bob is unable to get out of bed because his legs are completely numb. Worse still, the hospital are insisting his symptoms are psychosomatic. Martin's prophecy takes an even darker, deeper turn when the daughter also loses the ability to use her legs too, but that's where I'll leave the storyline. Everything in this film is designed to shoot our anxiety levels through the roof. Everything is off kilter, even the way they all talk in this kind of dead tone and the music alternates between these kind of eerie silences and really harsh nerve-wracking strings and drums while shots of surgery and blood are really, really stomach churning. Performances are really solid, especially when you look at how weirdly sort of unfeeling and formal and clinical everybody is. The tension and the suspense are built up masterfully until the last 30 minutes reach these levels of absolute insanity. Just wait for the blindfolded living room scene. It's 
unsettling, it's cruel, it's incredibly hard to watch, but it's also incredible to watch and forget. It's a film about repulsion, loss and vengeance, all to, told through the eyes of one of the modern greats, Yorgos Lanthimos. At number two, Nightcrawler. This film's directed by Dan Gilroy and it stars Jake Gyllenhaal as Lou Bloom. He's a petty thief who one night whilst driving his car past a car crash, he sees a Nightcrawler who's a cameraman capturing footage of the wreck to then sell on to a news station. So right then and there, Lou seems to have found his calling. So he gets straight into it, gets himself a camera, he gets this by pawning in a bike that he's stolen and then straight away he takes to it. I was going to say like a duck to water but he takes to it like a shark to water. So immediately without batting an eyelid he makes sure he does whatever it takes to be the first on the scene to the likes of car crashes, home invasions, robberies or any other violent crime. Something really sticks with him from one of the news, sta news stations when they tell him if it bleeds it leads. The more shocking the crime the more money he gets from the news station. He takes to it so naturally but mainly because he's a creep. What starts off as drive and determination develops into manipulating situations until what he's doing becomes something else entirely. Lou is pretty much a monster. He's the type of monster you don't see coming. The film has an amazing supporting cast of the likes of Bill Paxton, Rene Russo, but Riz Ahmed, who is eventually taken on as Lou's cameraman slash dog's body, gives a very different performance to Jake Gyllenhaal's but matches him in terms of acting chops. He is sensational. Jake Gyllenhaal completely transforms himself for this role both mentally and physically. He's lost a hell of a lot of weight to the point where his eyes are bulging out of his sunken face. He just looks icky and that's a good word for him icky he's a complete sociopath and you instantly get the impression he would actually murder someone just to video it in order to progress with his new career and he doesn't necessarily do it for the money it's all about the power and the respect just Lou being at these awful crime scenes and not knowing what he's going to do next sends anxiety levels through the roof coupled with the soundtrack that deliberately jars makes you feel really really creeped out and uncomfortable and it sort of hones in on Lou's sort of twisted optimism. This is one intense movie that's scary in the way because it just feels so authentic and real. Watching Lou arrive as the first on scene at a really bloody home invasion while he floats around the house with his camera capturing all of the horrors, it just feels so, so wrong. It's as if you're in the hands of the killer himself. At number one, Uncut Gems. So this film is directed by the Safdie brothers. It opens in 2010, some Ethiopia miners retrieve a rare black opal from a mine in Africa. Then it cuts to 2012. Howard Ratner, played by Adam Sandler, he plays this jeweller in New York City's Diamond District. He's this really fast-talking, fast-moving guy. He's always chasing the next big score. He just speeds through every single scene like he's dodging bullets. He's juggling calls from angry mobsters to bookies, his angry wife, whilst he's then sneaking off to his apartment for late night meetups with his girlfriend before eventually going home. His office in the Diamond District is the hub of all his sort of wrongdoings. It's got bulletproof glass doors and a buzzer that barely works. Harry seems to just thrive in all this mayhem. Then, one day, into the office comes the Celtics forward Kevin Garnett, playing himself. He's brought in by Howard's broker contact, played by Lakeith Stanfield. Howard brings out this black opal from the beginning of the film that he's just now acquired. He does it really just to show off, but... Kevin Garner instantly just is drawn to this amazing gem. Its beauty just really strikes him. So they come up with a deal where he gets to take it home for the night to bring him good luck for his big game. But to secure it, he gives Howard his championship ring, which Howard then pawns off so he can bet big on the next sure thing. This crazy pileup of choices is just the start of this sort of house of cards that 
topples over during the course of the film. Every time something goes right, he'll use that right to then make two wrongs. He lives his life robbing Peter to pay Paul, and then hiding from Peter. Safdie brothers put together sequence after sequence without taking a breather of easily the most anxiety inducing movie that I have ever seen. How this guy doesn't have a heart attack is beyond me. He lives his life turned up to 11 constantly and you know it's only a matter of time before his wife, his girlfriend, the bookies or the gangsters are going to catch up with him. The supporting cast are all superb even the smaller cast members a little pet hate of mine is with gangsters and in this the gangsters really feel like gangsters Dina Menzel really surprised me she can go from singing let it go which having two young daughters myself I still only hear sort of six to seven thousand times a week to a fantastic performance like this that could have easily come out on screen just as the wife everybody knows that adam sandler has got the acting chops most people have seen punch drunk love a lot of people love his comedy films but how he can go from the ridiculous six to a performance like this absolutely baffles me you cannot keep your eyes off the guy in this film. His physicality, his delivery, his accent, it is an outstanding performance. And to hold it all, this this amazing film together at such a fast pace, it really is a special performance. And the film itself, it's just such a pot boiler of tension. It honestly is one of the most stressful film experiences that I have ever had and it feels so authentic and so real. It wasn't until the, the film had actually finished that I realised that I could hold my breath for two hours. So that was my top five most anxiety inducing movies of the decade and I actually feel a bit stressed myself after that. I think I need to go and watch one of my kids Pixar films now. But anyway, I will be back in two weeks' time with another top five in another genre. I'll see you then. Cheers.